This is not a contemplation of mine, but, perhaps, even more worthy of contemplating than those I am blessed to share with you. It is an excerpt from Chapter 2 from the book Siddhartha by Hermann Hess, whose full LibriVox.org audiobook can be found both on my channel's YouTube playlist named Recommendations to Contemplate On and on the link in the description. I will surely by now not reveal a spoiler for you if I let you know beforehand that the Gautama Buddha mentioned in the excerpt is Siddhartha himself in the future. Also noteworthy is that the friend he talks with, named Govinda, is consistently addressed as Siddhartha's shadow by the narrator. Here goes for your own contemplation. And please, this is a metaphor. How do you think, Govinda? Siddhartha spoke one day while begging this way. How do you think we progress? Do we reach any goals? Govinda answered, We have learned, and will continue learning. You'll be a great Samana, Siddhartha. Quickly you've learned every exercise. Often the old Samanas have admired you. One day you'll be a holy man, O Siddhartha. Quoth Siddhartha, I can't help but feel that it is not like this, my friend. What I've learned, being among the Samanas, up to this day, this, O Govinda, I could have learned more quickly and by simpler means, in every tavern of that part of a town where the whorehouses are, my friend, among carters and gamblers I could have learned it. Quoth Govinda, Siddhartha is putting me on. How could you have learned meditation, holding your breath, insensitivity against hunger and pain, there among these wretched people. And Siddhartha said quietly, as if he were talking to himself, What is meditation? What is leaving one's body? What is fasting? What is holding one's breath? It is fleeing from the self. It is a short escape of the agony of being a self. It is a short numbing of the senses against the pain and the pointlessness of life. The same escape, the same short numbing, is what the driver of the ox-cart finds in the inn, drinking a few bowls of rice wine or fermented coconut milk. Then he won't feel his self any more, then he won't feel the pains of life any more, then he finds a short numbing of the senses. When he falls asleep over his bowl of rice wine, he'll find the same as what Siddhartha and Govinda find when they escape their bodies through long exercises, staying in the non-self. This is how it is, O Govinda. Quoth Govinda, You say so, O friend, yet you know that Siddhartha is no driver of an ox-cart, and a Samana is no drunkard. It's true that a drinker numbs his senses, it's true that he briefly escapes and rests, but he'll return from the delusion, finds everything to be unchanged, has not become wiser, has gathered no enlightenment, has not risen several steps. And Siddhartha spoke with a smile. I do not know. I have never been a drunkard. But that I, Siddhartha, find only a short numbing of the senses in my exercises and meditation, and that I am just as far removed from wisdom, from salvation, as a child in the mother's womb, this I know, O Govinda. This I know. And once again, another time, when Siddhartha left the forest together with Govinda to beg for some food in the village for their brothers and teachers, Siddhartha began to speak, and said, What now, O Govinda? Might we be on the right path? Might we get closer to enlightenment? Might we get closer to salvation? Or do we perhaps live in a circle, we who have thought we were escaping the cycle? Quoth Govinda, we have learned a lot, Siddhartha. There is still much to learn. We are not going around in circles. We are moving up. The circle is a spiral. We have already ascended many a level. Siddhartha answered, How old, would you think, is our oldest Samana, our venerable teacher? Quoth Govinda, Our oldest one might be about sixty years of age. And Siddhartha, he has lived for sixty years, and has not reached the nirvana. He'll turn seventy and eighty, and you and me will grow just as old, and will do our exercises, and will fast, and will meditate. But we will not reach the nirvana. He won't, and we won't. 
Oh, Govinda, I believe out of all the Samanas out there, perhaps not a single one, not a single one, will reach the Nirvana. We find comfort, we find numbness, we learn feats to deceive others. But the most important thing, the path of paths, we will not find. If you only, spoke Govinda, wouldn't speak such terrible words, said Arthur. How could it be that among so many learned men, among so many Brahmins, among so many austere and venerable Samanas, among so many who are searching, so many who are eagerly trying, so many holy men, no one will find the path of paths? But Siddhartha said in a voice which contained just as much sadness as mockery, with a quiet, a slightly sad, a slightly mocking voice. Soon, Govinda, your friend will leave the path of the Samanas. He has walked along your side for so long. I am suffering of thirst, O Govinda, and on this long path of a Samana my thirst has remained as strong as ever. I always thirsted for knowledge. I have always been full of questions. I have asked the Brahmins. Year after year I have asked the holy Vedas. Year after year I have asked the devoted Samanas. Year after year. Perhaps, O Govinda, it has been just as well, had been just as smart and just as profitable, if I had asked the hornbill bird or the chimpanzee. It took me a long time, and I am not finished learning this yet, O Govinda, that there is nothing to be learned. There is indeed no such thing, so I believe, as what we refer to as learning. There is, O my friend, just one knowledge. This is everywhere, this is Atman, this is within me, and within you, and within every creature. So I am starting to believe that this knowledge has no worse enemy than the desire to know it, than learning. At this Govinda stopped on the path, rose his hands, and spoke. If you, Siddhartha, only would not bother your friend with this kind of talk, truly, your words stir up fear in my heart. And just consider what would become of the sanctity of prayer, what of the venerability of the Brahmin's caste, what of the holiness of the Samanas, if it was, as you say, if there was no learning. What, O Siddhartha, would become of all of this what is holy, what is precious, what is venerable on earth? And Govinda mumbled a verse to himself, a verse from an Upanishad. He who ponderingly, of a purified spirit, loses himself in the meditation of Atman, unexpressible by words, is his blissfulness of his heart. But Siddhartha remained silent. He thought about the words which Govinda had said to him, and thought the words through to their ends. Yes, he thought, standing there with his head low, what would remain of all that which seemed to us to be holy? What remains? What can stand the test? And he shook his head. At one time, when the two young men had lived among the Samanas for about three years, and had shared their exercises, some news, a rumour, a myth, reached them, after being retold many times. A man had appeared, Gautama by name, the Exalted One, the Buddha. He had overcome the suffering of the world in himself, and had halted the cycle of rebirths. He was said to wander through the land, teaching, surrounded by disciples, without possession, without home, without a wife, in the yellow cloak of an ascetic, but with a cheerful brow, a man of bliss, and Brahmins and princes would bow down before him, and would become his students. This myth, this rumour, this legend resounded. Its fragrances rose up here and there. In the towns the Brahmins spoke of it, and in the forest the Samanas. Again and again the name of Gautama, the Buddha, reached the ears of the young men, with good and with bad talk, with praise and with defamation. It was as if the plague had broken out in a country, and news had been spreading around that in one place or another there was a man, a wise man, a knowledgeable one, whose word and breath was enough to heal every one who had been infected with the pestilence. And as such news would go through the land, and every one would talk about it, many would believe, many would doubt. 
but many would get on their way as soon as possible to seek the wise man, the helper. Just like this myth ran through the land, that fragrant myth of Gotama, the Buddha, the wise man of the family of Sakya. He possessed, so the believers said, the highest enlightenment. He remembered his previous lives. He had reached the nirvana, and never returned into the cycle, was never again submerged in the murky river of physical forms. Many wonderful and unbelievable things were reported of him. He had performed miracles, had overcome the devil, had spoken to the gods. But his enemies and disbelievers said, This Gautama was a vain seducer. He would spend his days in luxury, scorned the offerings, was without learning, and knew neither exercises nor self-castigation. The myth of Buddha sounded sweet. The scent of magic flowed from these reports. After all, the world was sick, life was hard to bear, and behold, here a source seemed to spring forth, here a messenger seemed to call out, comforting, mild, full of noble promises. Everywhere where the rumour of Buddha was heard, everywhere in the lands of India, the young men listened up, felt a longing, felt hope, and among the Brahmin sons of the towns and villages, Every pilgrim and stranger was welcome when he brought news of him, the exalted one, the Sakyamundi. The myth had also reached the Samanas in the forest, and also Siddhartha, and also Govinda, slowly, drop by drop, every drop laden with hope, every drop laden with doubt. They rarely talked about it, because the oldest one of the Samanas did not like this myth, he had heard that this alleged Buddha used to be an ascetic before, and had lived in the forest, but had then turned back to luxury and worldly pleasures, and he had no higher opinion of this Gotama. "'O oh, Siddhartha,' Govinda spoke one day to his friend, "'today I was in the village, and a Brahmin invited me into his house, and in his house there was the son of a Brahmin, from Magadha who has seen the Buddha with his own eyes, and has heard him teach. Verily this made my chest ache when I breathed, and thought to myself, if only I would too, if only we both would too, Siddhartha and me, live to see the hour when we will hear the teachings from the mouth of this perfected man. Speak, friend, wouldn't we want to go there too, and listen to the teachings from the Buddha's mouth? Quoth Siddhartha, Always, O Govinda, I had thought Govinda would stay with the Samanas. Always I had believed his goal was to live to be sixty and seventy years of age, and to keep on practising those feats and exercises which are becoming to a Samana. But behold, I had not known Govinda well enough. I knew little of his heart. So now you, my faithful friend, want to take a new path and go there where the Buddha spreads his teachings. Quoth Govinda, You're mocking me. Mock me if you like, Siddhartha. And have you not also developed a desire, an eagerness to hear these teachings? Have you not at one time said to me, You would not walk the path of the Samanas for much longer? At this Siddhartha laughed in his very own manner, in which his voice assumed a touch of sadness and a touch of mockery, and said, Well, Govinda, you've spoken well. You've remembered correctly. If you only remembered the other thing as well you've heard from me, which is that I have grown distrustful and tired against teachings and learnings, and that my faith in words which are brought to us by teachers is small. But let's do it, my dear. I am willing to listen to these teachings, though in my heart I believe we've already tasted the best fruit of these teachings. Quoth Govinda, Your willingness delights my heart. But tell me, how should this be possible? How should the Gautama's teachings, even before we have heard them, have already revealed their best fruit to us? Quoth Siddhartha, Let us eat this fruit, and wait for the rest, O Govinda. But this fruit, which we already now received thanks to the Gautama, consisted in him calling us away from the Samanas. Whether he has also other and better things to give us, O friend, let us await with calm hearts.